Welcome to this Introduction to Counselling Skills, Module 6. This module is going to look at the importance of supervision and the process of self-development to help you attain the skills you need as a counsellor or helper. You're going to learn what supervision is and the important role it plays in your development and the protection of yourself and indeed your clients. We're also going to go through some models about understanding the process of self-development and your central role in this process to develop and learn new skills and apply them. In order to meet ethical standards, we must have supervision in place. The supervisor needs to be properly qualified and trained to guide and support the counsellor, including having an understanding and experience of applying whatever theoretical perspective has been adopted by the counsellor. They are usually more experienced than you and have been practising for a longer period of time. Supervision is so much more than simply reviewing caseloads. It's an important part of providing counselling practitioners with regular opportunities to properly reflect on all aspects of their practice. Having supervision in place is a requirement of any public liability insurance. I'm going to explain the different aspects of supervision and introduce some more models to you. Your supervisor has a number of clear roles and responsibilities. Your job is to find a supervisor and when you do, you need to decide if they're a good fit and that the supervisor fits you and suits your practice and the theories that you've adopted. This can be such an important professional relationship as you learn and apply your counselling skills. So what's a supervisor there for? Well, they're there to give you access to their experiences, which may be many, many decades more than your own. They're there to make sure you're developing your skills, including reflecting on what you do well and what you need to work on. Your supervisor's there to ensure you're working safely, and that means looking after you as well as the client. A good supervisor will always ask what's going on in your life, and they'll check in with you and make sure that you're accessing any support that you need when you need it. They make sure that you're working within your level of experience and expertise and that you're not taking on cases that you're not qualified to deal with, particularly at a certain stage of your own development. A supervisor can offer a different perspective on your cases and they can provide you with examples of what they've done. They can tap into their network of support as well if you need to refer your client on to someone else. Your supervisor is there to share their experiences with you and tell you what they found has worked for maybe a particular presenting issue. They might recommend training or reading materials for you. They might encourage you to expand your experiences and apply your knowledge and practice if they see that you're holding back. Your supervisor can provide you with a safe space to be honest about your practice. This includes when things go well, as well as when things are more difficult or challenging. The supervisor is there to provide you with a safe space for where you can feel supported and encouraged in your practice. This is the seven-eyed model of supervision. This model is normally covered in more advanced counselling skills courses, but I wish I had learned about this model much earlier in my career because it would have helped me understand the importance of supervision so I thought it would be useful to tell you about it now. It's called the Seven-Eyed Supervisor Model, and this was developed by Peter Hawkins and Robin Shohet in 1985. I'm going to explain each element of the Seven-Eyed Model in turn. So when you look at this slide, you can see that there's a supervisor, the supervisee or therapist, and the client sits at the centre. The first eye of supervision is when both you and the supervisor focus on the client. The therapist, that's you, describes the client they're talking about, what they observed in the sessions, including body language, any presenting issues. The main purpose is to keep the client present in the supervision session, so the client is always seen as a person rather than a problem or a task to talk about. The second eye of supervision is when the therapist talks about and explains the intervention itself, i.e. the session with the client. 
the therapist explains to the supervisor what theory or approach they've used, the reasons behind this selection, why they chose it, and they also explain the different options they considered. The supervisor doesn't offer a solution here. This helps the therapist work through their own reasoning. And in my experience, this process can help you uncover if actually a different course of action may be better for the client moving forward. The third eye of supervision focuses on the client and the therapist's relationship. The therapeutic alliance that's been developed between the client and therapist is really important. The therapist explores how that relationship is working, what therapeutic connection they feel is developing with the client. The supervisor is then able to focus on the perspectives of both people to explore how well the therapeutic relationship is developing and being created and they can observe any things that they think need addressing. The supervisor is looking for interaction between the two people and to notice any transference or counter-transference between them. A good example of this was when I was talking to my supervisor and I was explaining that I felt quite bored in the session and I felt exhausted after the session with a particular client. The supervisor listened intently and they shared their observations with me that I was absorbing the fact that the client was totally bored with their life and they felt exhausted because nothing of any value was happening to them. They didn't feel valued or connected with anyone else and hence why I felt the same in the session. This really helped me to see that I was mirroring the client's behaviour and that I needed to break this cycle in my own behaviour to help the client in the next session. The fourth eye of supervision focuses on the therapist's processes. Your process includes your internal emotions and sensations, your own behaviours and those in relation to your clients, what responses you have within yourself when you listen to the client's story. What are you bringing into the sessions? Does the relationship with the client bring up anything? Does the client remind the therapist of another relationship whether past or present that they've had. Is this influencing your connection with the client? What motivations does the therapist have for the client? And is the intervention for them or is it for the client? The fifth eye of supervision focuses on the therapist and supervisor relationship. What happens in the counselling room can often play out between the supervisor and the therapist. The therapist or supervisee acts like the client and the supervisor takes on the role of the supervisee or the therapist. Does the therapist resist support or advice? Do they respond negatively to any challenges that the supervisor might make? This can give you insight into how the therapist interacts with the client. The sixth eye of supervision focuses on the supervisor's process. Do they notice any changes in themselves during the supervision session? Are they bored, annoyed, etc.? The supervisor reflects on these feelings and gains understanding if this is the relationship between themselves and the therapist, or the case they are discussing, or indeed something from outside the supervision meeting, perhaps another relationship or something else is going on in the supervisor's life that needs reflection. The seventh eye of supervision focuses on the wider context in which the client, the therapist and the supervisor work within. For the client, it's about their background and their reasons for seeking help. It's about the impact of the ethical framework and law that you are bound by and work within. It's also about the wider influences in your life and the client's life, both present and past. The supervisory relationship and previous experiences that each of you bring, including professional differences, are important. The supervisor recognises their own biases, stereotypes and how this can impact on their relationship with the supervisee. Any ethical or moral dilemmas that need to be explored for each person involved in the therapeutic relationship are covered in this wider context. Supervision is not just a quick chat about the client or reviewing the therapy offered. It's about so much more. It's about human relationships. 
the dynamics of the therapist and client relationship, the relationship the therapist has with themselves, and the relationship with the supervisor. These all offer different perspectives on the therapy being provided. This process doesn't just happen by accident, it takes practice. And one of the key cornerstones of making this process work effectively is called reflective practice, which we're going to now cover. I thought it would be useful to explain what reflective practice is by some of the things that I've learned in my time as a counsellor. So when I do my reflective practice, I sit down and go through what the session's been like for me and what I observed for the client. I sometimes take a break and read something else, it might be poetry or I might doodle or draw to help me access a different part of myself if I'm struggling to reflect on the experience and what I might have learned from it. This might sound a bit odd, but doing something creative when you find it hard to express yourself can help you see things differently and release any mental blocks you might have. I try and do this each day as a way of downloading my thoughts, feelings and reflections on how my sessions have been and what I've experienced and learnt from them, either about myself or about the client. It's a good discipline to get into early on in your work. So the next model I'm going to show you is a great step-by-step -step process to help you develop your own reflective practice skills. As I've said, reflective practice is a very important part of your responsibilities and it will help you get the most out of your supervision sessions and it will help you grow as a therapist. So what is reflective practice? OK, so the model I'd like to show you was designed by Graham Gibbs in 1988, and this gives some structure to learning from experiences. It offers a framework for examining experiences and learning and planning from these experiences based on what went well and what didn't go so well. It covers six key stages and I'm going to explain each of them in a bit more detail. The first stage of Gibbs cycle of reflective practice is in relation to a description of what happened. This is to help you set the scene. So when and where did it happen? Was it in the therapy room? Was it in a community centre? Um, who was present in the session? What did you and the other people do? Why were you there? What was your role? And what did you want to happen from the session as a result? Once you set the scene and described what happened, you then move on to what you were thinking and feeling. Here you can explore all the feelings and thoughts that you had during the experience and how they might have impact on how the therapeutic relationship was being developed. The kind of questions you might ask yourself here was, how was I feeling during the session? How did I feel before and after the session was completed? What do you think other people were thinking about the interaction that you had? What were they feeling, thinking, and did you notice any of the body language? What did you think about the situation? So after you've reflected on what you've been thinking and feeling and what you observed, it's now time to evaluate what went on. So what was good or bad about the experience? Have you had a chance to evaluate what worked and what didn't work in the situation? Here you're trying to be as objective and honest as possible. To get the most out of reflection, it's important that you focus on both the positive and the negative aspects of any situation, even if it was primarily one or the other. Some helpful things to think about to prompt your reflection is thinking, OK, what was good and bad about that experience? What did you and other people contribute to the situation, both positive and negative? What went well and what didn't go so well? Now it's time to do some analysis. What sense can you make of the experience based on your reflection so far? And here you want to target the different aspects that went well or poorly and ask yourself some questions about why did it go so well or why didn't it go well? What sense can I make of this situation? And what knowledge, whether it's mine or other people's, could help me understand this situation? After your analysis, you then move on to conclusions, thinking about what else could I have done? 
This is about what you've learned from your reflections so far. This is where you summarise your learning and highlight what changes to your actions could improve the outcomes in the future. So the kind of things you ask yourself now is, what did I learn from this situation? How could I be more positive perhaps? What skills do I need to develop myself to handle that situation better in the future? Was there anything else I could have done? And now you move on to the action planning stage. And this is when you decide how you would deal with a similar situation in the future or any changes you think might be more appropriate. You then just keep going around the cycle as part of your own personal development each and every time you have a session with a client. Reflective practice is an invaluable tool in terms of your own self-development. This is a continual process and you keep repeating the cycle and apply your increased level of awareness to improve your skills and provide a better service to the next client you interact with. This process provides valuable insights into your own practice that's useful for discussing with your supervisor and peers. Reflective practice helps ensure that counsellors work safely and operate within a clear ethical framework which protects themselves, their clients and the sector's reputation. The supervisor needs to encourage and promote an environment where the supervisee or therapist feels safe, listened to and supported. This enables them to undertake their work well. Ideally, supervision needs to be independent of line management, so there's no fear of honest disclosure. Peer supervision is also a useful support as part of your development. It's a chance to talk to other counsellors and helpers about their experiences and I've always found this a great opportunity to exchange ideas that are showing good results for other practitioners' clients that you can learn from. Confidentiality is key in these groups and there needs to be a clear understanding about protecting the privacy of yourself and your clients. So no names or identifying features are shared with anyone else other than broad information about the presenting issues and the backstory. Attendance of supervision sessions needs to reflect the number of hours you complete in practice and it must be undertaken regularly. In general terms, this is usually monthly for a minimum of one to two hours, depending on the number of clients the counsellor is seeing. This regular review ensures the counsellor accesses support which will help sustain them during their practice and enables them to discuss in confidence issues as they arise from supporting others. This includes a safe space for personal reflections of issues that clients trigger in the counsellor and how to apply self-support. Without this support, burnout is more likely to occur and counsellors may adopt unhelpful and possibly damaging counselling responses because they may have become disengaged from the process itself. The supervisor has a responsibility to provide honest feedback and to assess that the counsellor is working within their level of competence. This ensures that they do no harm to the clients they're working with. The supervisor should ideally be more experienced than the therapist and be able to access resources, including knowledge that the supervisee may not have access to. The supervisee then needs to take on responsibility for further reading or personal development. This aspect is critical. The supervisee or therapist must recognise that counselling approaches are evolving all the time and they need to keep up to date with new practices. Acknowledging that each client is unique and can present different challenges outside the experience of the counsellor means that ongoing development throughout their career is essential. The supervisor acts as a sounding board and can guide the supervisee when referrals to another practitioner are required and what is in the best interests of the client. This helps the counsellor recognise that they cannot be all things to all clients and that this is not a weakness, but it's about working safely. The supervisor should role model high levels of good practice in terms of skills, professionalism and personal boundaries to demonstrate some of the practices that the supervisee should be exhibiting to their clients. In order to help develop any skills, it's important that we understand that there are some common stages we all go through 
so we feel confident and skilled in any given area. This takes time, practice and patience. Here is another model that I found really helpful, particularly in the early stages of my training. It's called the Conscious Competence Model, and this explains how we acquire new skills. This model was developed by Noel Birch in the 1970s. The model helps explain how we learn and develop our skills. There are two key aspects. One is our level of awareness in our ability, and the second is about how we apply those skills. So what are core counselling skills? Well, there are several things to consider when discussing counselling skills. One is about the development of the key skills needed in order to help a client. And as we've covered before, these include active listening, summarising and paraphrasing. Also about things like attending behaviours, watching your body language, your tone of voice, etc. And about how you build rapport. Secondly, your level of competence, i.e. how good are you at applying these skills that you've learnt in the helping relationship. All of us will have skills that we apply well, and there will be areas that need to be worked on so that we can improve our level of competence. For example, you might be friendly and encouraging, enabling the client to talk openly, but you may struggle to really listen and then summarise what the client has told you. How you apply the skills and knowledge you've gained through your training and experience is very important. It's important to make the right choice in how you apply those skills for the benefit of the client. Your mindset or way of thinking will influence how you apply your skills. What you think your mind dictates how you behave, remember. Counselling skills involve mental processing, which determine your choices and how you apply your skills. For example, you may understand what active listening is, have practiced it and have become competent, but in your heart, you're skeptical if it works or not. This can make you a lazy listener who drifts in and out of active listening. This process is different for each person and in relation to each skill that we develop. We may lose confidence in our skills at various stages and feel like we've moved backwards at times as we consciously and practically increase our knowledge, experience and understanding. This is where the ability to accept feedback, self-reflect honestly and put in the effort to work on the areas we know we need to improve. From this point, we can begin to move forward and eventually master each counselling skill until we are unconsciously competent at the skills we apply in our work. So in this module, we covered the following areas. We looked at supervision, what it is and the important role it plays in our development and the protection that this gives us for ourselves and for our clients. We looked at the seven eyed model of supervision and why it's so important to understand all the different characters at play during counselling therapy. We then moved on to self-development, about understanding the process of self-development using the Gibbs cycle of reflective practice, and about understanding why reflective practice will make us better and better helpers and counsellors. And finally, we looked at the conscious competence model. And this is about how we learn and the process that we go through to enable us to eventually apply the skills that we have learned easily and effortlessly to the benefit of our clients.